O tihe Māori ora, uh, himi ana na mana whenua uh, ki tēnei rohi, uh, Taranaki whānau i te upoko o te ika, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koe uh, kara, uh, ena mana e ngā reo uh, raurangatira mā ana hoa e whā, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, greetings everybody, um, kara thank you uh, for your, your mihi and also Simon um, and Mike for uh, your kind words. I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, Deloitte and the other sponsors for helping uh, bring this to us and especially acknowledge uh, the Chamber Te Awe and the Wellington uh, Pacifica Business Network. Uh, Paul, you're a very, very busy man. Uh, I'm sure you'll be popping out to cook breakfast down, uh, down the road very shortly, but thank you uh, very much for, for all that you're doing as well. Can I acknowledge my ministerial colleague, uh, the Honourable Barbara Edmonds, um, who's with us here today. I'm sure there are a number of other members of parliament. It's always dangerous to start listing them off. You don't want to offend people. You never know when you're going to need them. Uh, so um, I just want to, uh, I can see, actually I can see a few there. There's Tamati Coffee. I saw Paul Eagle when I was coming in. Anyone else, um, please, my acknowledgements to you. Also acknowledge members of the diplomatic corps who are with us here today, including the Australian High Commissioner, uh, Harinder Singh. This is my sixth time for speaking at the Wellington uh, Chamber of Commerce's pre-budget speech. The sixth time around, there is certainly some familiarity in the budget process. There's the usual dance of me trying not to be filmed eating while not appearing to be rude to my hosts. I've actually got my KPI on that today. <laughs> I'm also very well used to my colleagues' long-standing commitment to putting in far more budget bids than there is money to fulfil them. And then there is the now traditional pandemic, natural disaster or global economic shock that accompanies our budgets. In fairness to the global economy, it's continued to come up with novel and creative shocks for us to deal with each year. Most notably, we faced the effects of COVID-19 and the necessary economic and public health response that followed from that. And as all of you are very well aware, this was followed by supply chain disruptions, including global labour supply issues and the energy crisis sparked by the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, both of which have fueled elevated rates of inflation. In April, the IMF again downgraded its forecast for global growth in 2023. To, to the point that growth in advanced economies is now expected to only be 1.3%. Over the next five years, the global economy is set to grow at the slowest pace since the 1990s. And obviously, more recently, we have seen here in New Zealand a number of extreme weather events that have brought the increasing impact of climate change to the forefront of our minds. We continue to acknowledge the significant impact that the cyclone and flooding has had on a number of communities, many of whom have been hit with further deluges this week. I'll have more to say about our support for these communities in the coming days. During the last few years, our economy and our society have undergone a series of whiplash shifts that have tested the resilience of our households, our communities, our business sector and our government. It's actually hard to imagine a period in post-World War II history when the well-being of our nation has been put under greater strain from an economic, environmental or social perspective. Now these are of course global trends and it all sounds very depressing, but in the face of these challenges, I believe that there is positive news for New Zealand. We have managed these challenges better than many countries who have been in similar positions. The success of our health response to COVID-19 is well known and has been recognised by many international organisations and observers. We can be extremely proud as a country that we have had the lowest excess mortality rate in the world across the period of the pandemic. And at the same time, since the emergence of COVID-19, economic activity in real terms is more than 6% above its pre-pandemic level. In the face of an historic economic shock, unemployment peaked at 5.2%, and as of the first quarter of 2023, sits at a near record low of 3.4%. Unemployment's actually been below 4% for seven consecutive quarters. And we are also beginning to see the shift in immigration numbers that many of you have been looking for. Numbers to the end of February show that we have net migration of 52,000. In the following month of March 2023, we saw more visas processed for people to work here than we did in the equivalent month in March 2019 before COVID hit. Now, none of these statistics are meant to downplay the current economic environment. 
It is seeing many New Zealanders struggling with the cost of living and businesses feeling the pressure of increasing prices and slowing activity. I know that it is tough out there for many people. What I also know is that it's better to be facing this situation with the numbers that I've just mentioned and with public debt significantly lower than many other countries and with inflation that is in the bottom third of the OECD. Our solid starting point comes from the hard work of businesses and workers with the support of government through the last few years. And this does mean that the challenges of 2023 can be met and that we will emerge strong and resilient through these difficult times. In response to all of this, the government has continued the balanced approach that took us safely through COVID. We've targeted support to those low and middle income households that are most exposed to cost of living pressures, including superannuitants, families and those on low incomes. Despite the welcome news that inflation does appear to have peaked, there is no doubt that it remains too high, and we are committed to playing our part in bringing that down, including by reducing our spending as a percentage of the economy over the coming years. I stand by our approach to COVID. It saved lives and it saved livelihoods. Now's the time to move back to a more sustainable fiscal position. So that's the context in which Budget 2023 has been developed. The Budget will have four overarching themes. They are supporting New Zealanders with the cost of living, delivering the services that New Zealanders rely on, recovery and resilience, including economic resilience, and fiscal sustainability. And it's the last of those, fiscal sustainability, that I'm focusing on today. Exactly what you want with your breakfast, I'm sure. However well we've responded to some of the shocks the economy has faced in recent years, these events have come at a cost. Lives have been disrupted by COVID-19, and those effects can endure in a way that's obscured by the success of the overall response. I just want to take a moment to make a particular acknowledgement of the mental health impact of the last few years. I recently spent time with a small business owner who, having successfully navigated COVID, found themselves dramatically affected by Cyclone Gabriel. They were stoic, but they were battered. The government has moved to provide further financial support to this person and others like them, but that mental toll is considerable. I urge anyone in those circumstances to reach out, including to the 1737 helpline, and for all of us to be aware of supporting those around us. In the case of businesses, I can also recommend the First Steps program developed by the government with the Auckland Chamber and EMA, which is specifically targeted to helping small and medium enterprises to cope with the strains that they are facing. Increases to the cost of living are also adding pressure, and these are not felt equally across society. Indeed, one of the pernicious things about higher inflation is that those with the economic power to do so are often able to pass on increased costs, while those with little economic power are the ones who ultimately bear the burden of inflation. The period of elevated inflation that we've seen in recent times has also put public services under considerable pressure. Now, you may have heard some people suggest that periods of high inflation are positive for the government, and that's true to some extent in terms of the flows of revenue. However, what that view doesn't take into account is the pressure that inflation is putting on the funding of public services that New Zealanders rely on. As I mentioned earlier, I don't need to tell you that the labour market's been tight, and finding staff coupled with accelerated wage growth has put pressures on businesses. Given that the government is the largest employer in the economy, I also understand that. And we've been working to backfill the infrastructure deficit that's been built up over, after decades of underinvestment. And that includes work to improve the supply of housing in New Zealand in order to make home ownership more affordable and to accelerate the building of our housing stock. These sorts of projects are central to the vision that the Labor government has for New Zealand. But they are not immune to the limits that the construction sector capacity has hit up against or to the supply chain disruptions that have pushed up material costs. We're buying the same jib that you are, and we're having the same difficulties of accessing skilled labour at a time when unemployment rates are low across developed countries. So others may suggest to you that inflation means that the government can afford to do any number of things, including tax cuts. Now, this might be a convenient political line to run, but I don't believe it's an economic policy that's appropriate to this time in New Zealand. Adequately funding the services New Zealanders rely on every day is a serious challenge, 
and one which has occupied much of our time and resources in the budget that I'll deliver next week. Picking up what Mike just said, making sure that we meet the needs of our people in health, in education and in housing is core, and it simply has to come first. Now, this still requires hard trade-offs and difficult decisions. I appreciate that not all of you would have agreed with every decision that I have made as Finance Minister. If you did, I possibly shouldn't be in the job I'm in. But I do hope that people would credit me with always being upfront about the challenges we're facing and what difficult decisions mean for our future. I don't go around telling people that spending on public services can go up, public debt can go down, and taxes can be cut all at the same time. That fiscal Bermuda Triangle is the domain of the opposition, and I don't believe it's realistic or credible. If someone is asking you to trust them with running the government, and they can't clearly tell you how they will pay for it, or what we will be giving up in order to meet their promises, then they're not taking you seriously, or, in my view, the responsibility of governing. Our approach is to find balance in our fiscal strategy. We will continue to make use of our balance sheet, particularly to fund long-term infrastructure. Now, when we refer to using the government's balance sheet, what we actually mean is that we're making a judgment that supporting each other through the difficulties of a particular shock or meeting a long-term need is worth spreading some of those costs over a longer period of time. We have made good use of our balance sheet, and I do believe that was worth doing because we made it through challenges like COVID in a stronger position as a country than we otherwise would have. At times in the past, the debate around public debt in New Zealand has been one that's gone beyond what's a sensible level of caution for a small open economy to one that prioritised reaching a very specific debt target as if it was an end in itself and to the neglect of many other important considerations. We need to be clear-eyed about the fact that as a result of climate change, extreme weather events are occurring more frequently and with greater intensity, and as a country, we need to build our resilience. From the point of view of the government's finances, we do have space within the fiscal rules that we've set to manage the costs associated with responding to COVID-19 and the recent extreme weather events. Our debt sits at around 19% of GDP, well below the 30% ceiling that we indicated when we set the fiscal rules last year. It continues to compare well with the countries that we like to compare ourselves to, such as Australia at 36%, the United Kingdom at 95%, and the United States at 96%. Now, it is clear that the economic outlook has slowed, both here in New Zealand and internationally, and it's inevitable that this will have an impact on our key fiscal indicators. We can also expect to see tax revenue lower than we previously expected, as we saw in the Crown accounts to the end of March that were released this week. Our position remains strong and we are resilient, but there is no avoiding global and climatic forces. As the Prime Minister has demonstrated through the reprioritisation exercise, we have brought our focus back to a smaller number of things that the country needs to get right now and those things done well. Other priorities, which while they may be important, are ultimately discretionary and they've been stopped or deferred. We have seen a large amount of spending associated with COVID-19 coming out of the system, and our spending is now tracking back towards the low 30% of GDP range that New Zealand has tended to operate in in recent decades. We're striving for balance here as well. Going faster in that track would require significant cuts to core services to austerity levels and would have long-term consequences for people and communities, and I am not prepared to do that. In order to make sure that we can ensure the well-being of our people through an increasingly uncertain future, there are a few things that we will be doing. First, as the Prime Minister mentioned in his pre-budget speech at the end of April, the further costs that the government will incur in relation to the cyclone recovery will be met within the budget operating allowance or multi-year capital allowance. This means that on the operating side in particular, we have put responding to the cyclone ahead of some of the other priorities that ministers would have liked to progress. I'm not suggesting that this is the way in which governments should always choose to respond to major shocks. However, we are in an environment where the economy is still tight, and it is therefore important that fiscal policy continues to work alongside monetary policy. Secondly, to ensure that we have an ongoing focus on efficiency and on prioritisation within the public sector. 
Now, this is not just something that we'll be asking ministers and agencies to do in the current tight conditions. It's something that we need to continue to drive and get better at if we're going to achieve the sort of things New Zealand should. I appreciate that this is the kind of thing that ministers of finance are supposed to say, and that regardless of political orientation, it's part of the job to see more efficiency, greater value for money, and greater prioritisation among other agencies. But we have to take action to prove that it's more than words. And so, finally, the budget sees the outcome of the request that the Prime Minister made of Cabinet to look closely at their baselines for opportunities for savings, efficiencies and reprioritisation. For the budget I will announce next week, agencies were told that we would be looking at a wide range of factors in determining their level of budget funding, including how many vacancies they were carrying, historic rates of underspends and the growth of FTEs over time. Ministers were sent a clear message that if they wanted to progress particular priorities, they needed to be looking for savings opportunities within their own agency's existing budgets. The outcome of this exercise is that Budget 2023 will include $4 billion of savings and reprioritisations over the four-year forecast period. For the most part, this funding has gone toward funding agencies' existing cost pressures. We'll detail in full what makes up this number when the budget's released next week. But to be clear, these savings have been found across a wide range of areas, some of which have been well publicised already. This includes closing contingencies that we weren't convinced were still needed, reassessing the forecast requirement of government departments, and returning as savings underspends from existing initiatives. The reprioritisation exercise has seen programmes such as the public media mergers stopped, the clean car upgrade and social leasing schemes curtailed, and further funding associated with the affordable water reforms and COVID programmes that are no longer needed returned. This kind of work's ongoing, but we've redoubled our efforts on it in this budget process. And I think we owe that to New Zealanders as they are carefully considering their spending and making trade-offs in their lives that we do the same. So, as I said at the beginning of, of the speech, there is a certain familiarity for me now in putting a budget together. But equally, I approach each of our bu budgets with a sense of the privilege of being in the position to be able to put together a programme that will support New Zealanders to achieve their potential. The shift we made to wellbeing budgets four years ago was driven by my belief that for all the numbers and percentages and forecasts that underpin a budget, our focus has to be on what it does for our people and for our environment and for our communities. And it has to focus on what we're doing for future generations. And this budget continues that approach. Equally, we can't deliver our wellbeing approach without being careful and considered when it comes to the financial domain. And that's what you'll see in this budget. You will see a balanced approach that will also have an eye to a future of a high wage, low emission economy that delivers economic security in good times and bad. Or to put it simply, we must support people today while building a better tomorrow. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.